Hello pre-calc kids, welcome back to another lesson in AP Pre-Calculus. This is Mr. Bean. Today's lesson, we're going to be talking about this thing called competing function model validation. What in the world is that type of a title for a lesson? Well, basically, we're trying to figure out these different models, which when we're, they're competing against each other to figure out which model is the best fit. Now, those of you who are in stats classes and you hear best fit for a data set, if you're in an AP stats class or a regular stats class, you'll have heard that before and you're used to dealing with this thing called R and R squared. We are not going to be using that in this course. You don't have, we're not going to get that detailed with the statistics portion of it, figuring out which one's the best fit. We're just going to look at some generalizations of an idea of how to know. So the, one of the ways, the first thing we're going to look at is this thing called contextual clues. So when we have these contextual clues, what we're looking for is for the scenario, is it something that it's growing at a constant rate? If it is, that's linear. Is it growing at a linear rate of change where the, the rate of change is linear? That means that it is a quadratic. Is it growing at a proportional rate? That would be exponential. So if it's the idea is trying to figure out just from the scenario, can we tell? So for example, here's a pizza. It's coming out of the oven. It's hot. It's going to cool down for a while. We take some measurements and so forth ten, every 10 seconds. The recorded temperature with respect to time is going to, can be modeled by either a linear, quadratic, or exponential function. In other words, all three of them kind of give us a, a decent idea for this thing. And so what we're trying to figure out is for each of those three models, if they all appear to represent the data, how do we know which one's the best? So as you look at these options here, we've got a linear model is best, context, quadratic, exponential, but is it best based on what? Contextual clues. The contextual clue is your knowledge of these types of problems and how they work. A pizza that's really hot is when it cools down, that's actually what's called Newton's law of cooling. We've done a few of those, even in this course, we've done them. The answer of this is C. It's an exponential model. It's an exponential decay model. We did that with like the hot cocoa and other things. When it, something's hot and it cools down towards room temperature, it cools down at an exponential decay rate like that. Okay, so that's just based off of contextual clues. So it's reading the problem, figuring out which one would just be best, knowing how that type of data works. Another useful way is this thing called residuals. When we look at the residuals, they can help us know if a model is appropriate or not. So what is a residual plot? First of all, let's remember some things we've already been doing, which is a, with a regression line or a regression curve that fits the data. So here we have a few different data points, and this dotted line is a regression curve. It's an exponential curve for this data set. A residual value is a measure of how much a regression curve vertically misses a data point. So for example, that is a tiny little bit above. This is a little bit below, a little bit above, a little bit below. This one's larger. So that's got a, a little larger value that it missed it. This one's a smaller, this one's a bit larger. So that distance right here, it looks like from 100 to 20, that's about a distance of 20. This distance here, I don't know, that's a, like I'm estimating about a four. This distance, okay, so you can see what I'm doing here. I'm just trying to estimate. That is, I don't know, 15. I'm totally just kind of estimating here. So this would be the residual values, how far it's missed the point. So you take the actual measured data point and you subtract the predicted value. That gives you what's called a residual. So the actual minus the predicted. The predicted is the curve. The actual is the, the literal, it's the point. It's the coordinate point that we, we have from the data set versus the predicted is the model. Okay, so subtract those things, you get the, the residual. Now, from there, we take those residuals and we can create a residual plot. And this residual plot is actually not exactly the matching set here. See how this is 20? So that part 20 should be, meaning that that would be, this point would be all the way up here at 20. So if this was 15, it'd be like way up here. Most of these other points are pretty close. I, I just realized that this one was off a little bit. Uh, so, but that's the idea of a, of a residual plot is that we, so these represents the plots of the misses, how far off it missed the exponential curve. So this is zero right here. This x-axis, it represents that line all the way across here. It represents the, the model that we have. So if it was right on that line, I can't even draw a straight line. If, it was, if we had a dot that was right on that line like that, then that would mean back here, that point would, it would be right on the curve itself. So right on the x-axis on a residual plot means there is no distance 
and it's exactly on the curve. Okay, so that is what is represented by a residual plot. Now, I'm gonna switch this thing up here. The difference between a predicted and actual value, when you take the predicted and you subtract the actual, then you get the error. An error in the model is how far the predicted and actual are. Now notice the difference here. Up on the, the residual is the actual minus the predicted. That gives us a residual. If you switch them around, you get the error. The reason that's important, in fact, I, I think I have this on here on the notes below. Yeah, I do. So notice that a residual and an error are very similar and often they are used synonymously. You'll hear people say residual or error interchangeably. Technically, that's not exactly right. They're not in the exact same thing, but they're very, very similar. And so you'll hear people use them. The reason we want to look at error is because the error helps us know if it's an overestimate or an underestimate when we look at the error. So predicted minus actual is what we're going to be focused on for this lesson, trying to figure out the error. So here we have a set of data. We got somebody who's shooting a bunch of basketball shots. This is how many he makes. And let's just come up with a regression curve. Okay, I'm not going to make us do this in the calculator. We've been practicing that all the time. So let's save some time. I've already done that in advance. Here is the regression model. M of T equals 0.417 T minus 8.701. If you want to write that down, get that down. Save us some time here. So this is a linear regression curve. And we're going to use that model then to find some things. First, find the error at T equals 50. To do that, we find M of 50. So M of 50 equals 12.149. What did I do here? I plugged the 50 into the model, plug the 50 in there, figure that out. So that's 12.149. That's not the error. That's just what does M of 50 equal? Now we want to compare that to the actual. We're looking at the predicted value minus the actual. That gives us the error. So the predicted is the model. The model predicts for us. So we do the 12.149 which was the predicted, minus the actual, which was 20. He made 20 shots. And then we have a negative 7.851. So that is the error. And the sign of the error tells us that it's an underestimate. So here's our little statement that I've got here. The predicted value 12.149 is an underestimate of the actual value of 20. So that 12.149 is smaller than 20, so that's easy enough to see actual number, the error, which you'll be asked to find sometimes, the error is that. And then the, the sign of it helps us to know that it was an underestimate. But if you're not sure, was it an underestimate, overestimate, just think through it. Just think through, okay, well, here's the actual. Uh, and then you look at the predicted. Is the predicted bigger than the actual or smaller than the actual? And then you know if the predicted is an underestimate or an overestimate. Okay, so pretty straightforward on that part. There's another way of using these residual plots to answer some questions. This is going to like this is a good question. This really helps to know do you understand what a residual plot is? So here we have some cars that are that are uh, being tested for their braking distance. You got a regression model. It doesn't say what type of regression model, but we don't need to know. Uh, so you've got the weight of the car as the input and the braking distance in feet as the output. So we have a given residual plot. It's got one point labeled, labeled P with this coordinate point. 3,300 comma negative 15. What does point P indicate in the context of this problem? All right, so this value 3,300, that represents something to do with the weight of the car. The negative 15 is the output. It has something to do with a braking distance. So what is this? So when you have a car that's 3,300 feet, what does this negative 15 represent? It's negative 15 from the model negative 15 feet off of the model. So here's the statement we write out. Because point P is below the x-axis, for the car with a weight of 3,300 pounds, the model is overestimating the actual braking distance. See, the model is the line, and so the model is overestimating that car's braking distance by 15 feet. That's how we put this into context. Okay, so make sure you get this written down. Uh, being able to answer questions like this really does show that you understand the use of a residual plot and what the all of these little dots mean. Now the last part of our lesson is pretty quick. I'm just going to some things we just got to show you here and that is when we look at the residual plots, can we just know right away by looking at it if that residual plot is a uh, representative of a good model? So here's how we know. Do the residual plot the residuals exhibit a clear pattern? 
is there a pattern to this thing? Not on this one. These dots are just kind of crazy all over the place. When the, the residual dots all, are all over the place and there's no pattern, that's actually a good thing for us. That means that the model that was used for this is a good model. When there's no clear pattern, that is good. It's the opposite of what you'd think. Whereas if you have a pattern like these, these have some type of pattern to them. This one's kind of growing up. This one looks like a parabola. This one is kind of some weird X. It's like two lines that are crossing each other. When you have some type of a pattern that the residuals create, then the model that's represented by each one of these is not a good model for the data set. You have a regression model that's not good for the data you've, you're working with. Okay, so we'll, you'll have a few problems here just identifying which ones are good, which ones are bad, and just saying, okay, yeah, this one's bad. Why is it bad? Because it creates a pattern. This one's good. Why is it good? Because there is no pattern. That's how you talk about that. All right, that's everything for this lesson. This is Mr. Bean signing off, and rock that mastery check. I'll see you back in the next one.